Okay, so uh, I just posted this document that says final exam topics. And um, yeah, I'm still kind of writing it and I kind of have to finalize exactly how many questions, how many problems to put on there to make it an appropriate length for the, uh, the, time, the time that we have. Um, but these are kind of the, uh, the ideas that I have for possible topics and possible problems. And um, I probably won't put every single one of these on. But um, but if I do put a problem on, it'll probably be, um, yeah, it'll be several of these. Okay, so um, one is a KN classifier. I'll provide you some training data. The data will exist in two classes. And it will basically be a list of coordinates and their labels. And I'll provide a test point. And based on the test point, you will tell me if, uh, you know, tell me the classification of the test point if k equals 1 or if k equals 3, k equals 5, or k equals 7, or something like that. So you'll have to kind of measure, you know, the distance from this point to every other point, et cetera, et cetera. Okay? And, um, and from there, you'll say, okay, this is going to be class 1 or class 2 or something, class A, class B. Okay, uh, one, another possible problem is uh, one for support vector machines. Um, so I'll provide you kind of a, a series of pictures uh, along with kind of the, the boundaries drawn by SVM. And, um, and I'll also kind of provide, you know, the commands that I use to generate these, these pictures and boundaries. But uh, I won't, uh, but your job will be to match which command goes with which picture, okay? So it'll be like, um, you know, one of the commands I used was, uh, you know, SVM where the kernel was uh, radial, or the Gaussian kernel, uh, with cost 10 and gamma 1, okay? Or here's another boundary drawn where cost was... 10 and gamma was 10, or here's a boundary drawn where cost was 10 and gamma, or you know, cost was 1 and gamma was 10 or something, and I'll ask you to kind of try to match up which picture goes with which. All right, you had a problem kind of like that in the homework, but, um, but here it'll be like, here's a picture and, you know, figure out what, the, what command was used. Uh, I might give you a k-means clustering by hand. And I'll provide you some two-dimensional data. It's all unlabeled. And I would provide also just some random initial assignments. I'll say, OK, so randomly these are assigned to cluster 1 and cluster 2 and, and things like that. And based on that, you would do kind of maybe one or two full iterations of k-means clustering. So based on the current initial assignments, you'll find the centroids. Once you find the centroids, you'll update the assignments. Once you update the assignments, you'll find the centroids. And once you find the centroids, you'll update the assignments again. Okay, that would be two full iterations. That's uh, k-means clustering by hand. All right. Um, uh, I might also give you k-means clustering with a kernel. Um, and here I would give you some kind of transformation function one that goes from 2D to 3D. And I would also provide you with a small data set and uh, also some initial cluster assignments. And then you would transform the data and then um, redo assignments, OK? I guess this is a tiny bit out of order, but uh, you might also get a base classifier problem. And in the Bayes classifier problem, it will either be a binomial or a normal um, PDF situation, okay? Uh, and as far as the prior goes, um, you would just use the proportion that exists in the training data. And then I would provide a test case, and you would say, okay, well, based on uh, what I have in the training data, based on what I have um, 
you know, for our test case, this is going to be my estimated classification. So let's say it was uh, a normal problem. You might, uh, you know, you might have two classes, and I'll, I'll give you some measurements in two classes, and then so this might be like the the heights of uh, males and females, and you know we have so we have five people, you know, one. 70 inches, 73 inches, you know, 65, 62, 69, and we're going to say, okay, uh, a person in our data set is 68 inches tall, what would be the Bayes classifier, classifier probability? You know, what pr probability is this person, um, you know, classified as male or female or something like that based on their height? Okay, or um, you might get a binomial problem kind of like the uh, marbles from the factory uh, where it would be like, you know, this many bags came from factory A, factory B, or factory C, or something like that, okay? Um, probably not factories and marbles, but, um, you know, something similar where, you know, now your data is not the height of someone, but, you know, what proportion in your data or what count in your data is, uh, you know, this, this percentage, okay? So your test case here will say there's 20 pieces and three are blue, so that's what, 15%. Uh, and based on that, do you think it's factory A, factory B, or factory C? What's, what's the probability of each of these things? Okay. So, you know, you would want, want to know your uh, binomial PDF, or PMF, I should say, and normal PDF. Okay. Uh, you're allowed to, uh, I will, for the final exam, I'll let you have two full sheets of notes, okay? So letter-sized papers, writing on the front and back, handwritten, typed, that's fine, two full sheets, okay? Um, okay, and then um, today I'm covering EM and PCA, and these are possible problems associated uh, with that. Uh, and so for the EM algorithm, today's example I'm doing two-dimensional data, but you could apply it for, say, unidimensional sets, so just one-dimensional data. And we'll, you know, I'll say it, it comes, you know, we're going to assume that it comes from a normal distribution. And with this, um, you know, I would provide kind of, you know, our current, the current value. So the EM algorithm is iterative. And you'd say, okay, the next values are based on your current values. And so I'll tell you, you know, your current values or your most recent values, you have this mean and this sigma value, you know, for a cluster one or cluster two or something like that. And based on that, you'll recalculate the weights of each point and you'll recalculate, you know, your, say, your weighted means or something like that, okay, for the, uh, for the EM algorithm. And then... Um, um, today I'll introduce PCA, and uh, you know the way we look at PCA is as a dimension reduction tool. And so, if I give you an example, uh, a problem using PCA on the final exam, what it will be is I will provide you with data in two dimensions, and I'll ask you to use PCA to find kind of the principal components, and use that to reduce the data from two dimensions down to one dimension. And that's what um, that's what we would do in uh, for PCA, okay? And then uh, and then there could be a uh, there will be a handful of conceptual questions, and the conceptual questions I, uh, could span the entire course, okay? So as far as kind of like the ones where you do have to do math and calculations and stuff like that, um, this is all stuff from after the midterm exam, right? Like uh, um, so I think everything you know prior to the midterm exam, uh, it, there's there's not overlap here, okay? Um, but uh, but conceptual questions, I could uh, I could ask questions from earlier on in the course, okay? But as far as um, but as far as calculation stuff, uh, it will not be outside of the kind of list of problems that I've, I've listed here, okay? And I probably won't do all seven of these things, um, so trying to 
figure out exactly how much time um, you have to work on it. You know, you have uh, basically an hour and 50, okay, an hour and 50 minutes, 110 minutes. So I'll have to kind of judge exactly how long to make the final exam. I think if I did all of these problems, it would uh, be too much. So I'll, I'll probably cut maybe, I'll probably reduce it down to six and I'll probably cut uh, two of these two of these things out of here and, uh, and I'm still trying to figure out exactly uh, which ones uh, to cut okay all right any uh, any questions okay all right so so today I will cover the EM algorithm and PCA or at least as much as I can um, I, ha I posted homework five right okay so uh, for practice, I will post a homework six, but it, homework six will not be assigned, it will not be collected, it won't be graded, okay? But homework six kind of covers PCA, and, uh, and probably I will not even post. So, uh, you know, I'm, I'm, <laughs> if it hasn't been obvious, I've been just kind of like taking all of my stuff from spring quarter and, uh, and using it uh, here, okay? And so in spring quarter, you know, I, I gave them a full homework six PCA and whatnot. And probably what I will do is I will trim down that thing to just kind of the portions that are relevant for the final exam. And I will post it, but I won't even collect it or grade it. It'll just be there as a tool to help you study and learn in preparation for the final. Okay? So, um, uh, so. Because I, I, I think, I like to think, <laughs> maybe it's not, maybe your story is different, but I like to think that the homework, by doing the homework, it helps you learn a little bit or understand some of these ideas a little bit better. And so, um, so I, I do want to kind of provide you with uh, some exercises, at least for PCA. Um, but, uh, but yeah, uh, we'll, we'll, you know, it's just being in the summer, you know, we have to kind of trim some of the, some of the stuff down. So, um, so I'll just kind of give you a, like a shortened version of homework six, and again, not assigned, not collected, no, not graded. It'll just be there for uh, studying. So that, um, and then on Tuesday, <laughs> the day, I guess our, our final session before the final exam, um, I'll just kind of do. Uh, like I'll show you a little demonstration of PCA. I'll, it'll just be like some demos of stuff, not like actual content that you need to like learn and memorize. I don't. I just not. I don't know how much I can expect you to master between uh, you know with a forty-six hour timeline. So um, so anyway, uh, this this is here and. Uh, my hope is you can start studying and feel comfortable with it and, and be ready for the final, uh, which will be one week from today, okay? And, uh, and today we'll cover the e EM and, uh, and, and introduce PCA. Okay, any questions? Okay, all right. Well, uh, so I think this is posted. There's a, uh, I think the version up here, there's a typo. It says P. DF for the binomial, but it's a, it's discrete, so it's a PMF. Um, okay, let's uh, let's go ahead and open up. Um, Professor Cristo would be uh, so ashamed. <laughs> no. <laughs> the, okay, um, I'm, I'm kidding. No, oh, where did you? Okay, so that's that. Over here, yeah. Okay. Well, yes. I just wonder about are you recording? I think this is being recorded. Yeah, I sure hope so. Oh, yeah, yeah. I had all kind of you know on Tuesday, like the software crashed, and uh, I'm trying again today. I hope it rec works, and if not, I'll just I will just go home disappointed. Okay. Um, maybe, maybe it, let me just see. I'm going to click record. 
I think something's wrong with it. They, they updated the software and they like allow you to put your webcam in like a circle or something. I think something is just not good with it. And so I gotta, I gotta figure this out. I'll send them error reports. Okay. All right. So, um, this is, uh, we're going to look at the EM algorithm, basic ideas of EM. And, uh, and, uh, here's a recommended video. Um, uh, for the EM algorithm, okay. Uh, the EM algorithm is uh, we use it in situations where you have both missing data and also unknown parameters, okay. And uh, and it's an iterative thing, so we we kind of have to switch between guessing our missing values and guessing the unknown parameters. And so. Um, here is one scenario, which is easy, okay? Uh, you have a missing value, but the parameters are known. Um, and, and I'm using these examples, uh, which, which come from uh, uh, Ritvik Math's uh, YouTube channel. Uh, this is a UCLA alum. Um, <laughs> so um, anyway, uh, let's say you are told you have the values 1, 2, and some missing value x. And we know that they come from a known distribution. And that known distribution is a normal distribution where the mean is 1 and standard deviation one is 1. OK? And my question is, what would you guess? What's like your, your highest probability guess for the missing value x? Well, you'd say, OK, well, if I know the probability, if the distribution is a normal distribution with mean 1, kind of your maximum, the, the guess with the maximum likelihood would just be one, right? It, you would just guess the value right at the mean. And now we would account for it and say, sure, it could be higher, it could be lower because of randomness. But if you wanted me to kind of maximize the probability of my guess, we would just guess one, the value at the mean. Okay? Simple enough, right? Um, on the other hand, let's say I give you the values one, two, and zero, and I tell you they're coming from a normal distribution, but the mean of this normal distribution is unknown. Okay? And so now I say, okay, well, what guess, what is your guess for the mean of this distribution, All right? And then so this is now maximum likelihood estimation. And you'd say, okay, well, your data is 0, 1, and 2. And if, uh, if you have the um, normal distribution, then your maximum likelihood estimate for the mean is going to be the mean of your sample. So you'd say 0, 1, and 2. We add those up, we divide by 3, and we're going to say my maximum likelihood estimate for the mean of the normal is going to be the value 1. Okay, so that, that's, that's very straightforward, I think, right? Both of these examples. Okay, so now imagine we're in this scenario where I say our data is 1, 2, missing value x, okay? And they're coming from a normal distribution, but we actually don't know the mean of this normal distribution, okay? So what is your best guess for x, and what's your best guess for this unknown parameter mu? All right? And this is, this is kind of the situation that we're in. And, and it's going to be, we're going to have an iterative approach, okay? So we're going to say, um, first, we can take a guess for mu, okay, and we can just start off with just some random, uh, not random, but just an arbitrary value. We can just say, okay, let's let's pretend mu is zero. How how does that fare, okay? And so, if mu is zero, our initial guess for mu is zero, then what's our best guess for x? We would plug in we would plug in zero for x, right? And so now our, quote, data is 1, 2, and this 0 is, we guess is 0. Okay? Now based on this, our best guess for mu is now 1. Okay? So we update our guess for mu. Okay? And if we update our guess for mu, okay, then we'll up, the next step will be update our guess for x. So now our guess for x is going to be 1, 2, and 1. 
okay? And then, um, and now if this is our data, one, two, and one, then our best guess for mu is gonna be the average of this data, which will be 1.33. And if I do that, then I'll go back and I'll update my guess for x, and it'll be one, two, 1.33. And I, I go through this iterative approach where I update my missing values. I say, okay, using the kind of my current guesses of the parameters, I'll update my missing values. And then once I update my missing values, I'll say, okay, what are my, how, what are my best guesses for the parameters? And I update my parameters. And I go back and forth, and then eventually we'll reach some kind of convergence where uh, the best guess for x is 1.5 and the best guess for mu is 1.5. Okay? And that's kind of a, that's a simple idea of the EM algorithm, is that you have this step where you're going to um, give, get the, uh, the values that you would kind of expect under your current set of parameters. And then once you kind of have the, the values that you have, you're going to find the parameters that maximize the, the likelihood of that data. Okay, And that's, that's the E part and the M part. The EM is for expectation and maximization. Okay, what is what are the values that you would expect? Okay, that's one 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 half of the iteration. What are the values that would maximize the your your the values that you're currently have? Okay, and that's uh, that's the EM get, um, algorithm. And so this can be applied. The EM algorithm can be applied in all kinds of scenarios. Okay, and so you can have this very simple scenario where you have like one one value missing and and, and you go kind of back and forth. Um, here I'm going to do it for a, a Gaussian mixture. So we're going to say we have kind of uh, a set of data and we're going to pretend or we're going to just uh, uh, we're going to say um, the data that we have comes from uh, or the data that we have is actually a mixture of values coming from three different multivariate normal or multivariate Gaussian distributions, okay? And so the way our data is being produced, um, so this is, this is what we, this is our model for how the data is being produced, is that data can come from, you know, cluster one, cluster two, or cluster three. And the probabilities that they come from each of these clusters is going to be 0 0.5, 0 0.3, and 0 0.2. So half of the values come from cluster 1, 30% from cluster 2, and 20% from cluster 3. And then um, if they come from cluster 1, they come, uh, cluster 1 has a mean of 0, 0, and this, uh, whatever this is, this variance matrix sigma, Cluster 2 has a mean of 4, 4, and has this variance covariance. And cluster 3 has a mean of negative 4, negative 4, and has this kind of variance matrix here. And so um, if we look at the, uh, sorry, let me, I'm having trouble with my, two-factor authentication here. Okay, I think we're good. <laughs> um, so this is how we could represent the PDF of the mixture, all right? Um, you have your value, x. This is a point in two-dimensional space. And this kind of super parameter uh, theta, okay, collects all of the parameters from all the different mixtures, right? So if you look at this, how many parameters do we have? We've got a whole bunch. We have the mix, mixture parameter alpha, which is like the proportions of each of these components. And then each component has its own mean, has its own variance matrix, right? So we have three mean vectors, we have full, uh, three variance matrix matrices. So we kind of have, you know, seven, seven parameters here, um, each of which contain multiple values, okay? 
So we're going to just gather them all together in just one object, theta here. You know, this is just mathematically speaking, I guess. Okay. Um, and the probability of getting any, you know, value is going to be basically a mixture. Uh, we multiply alpha. We, we weight um, the PDF. This is, this P is just the, your probability density function. In our case, it's the multivariate normal PDF. Okay, so we're going to take our multivariate normal PDF and we multiply it by a proportion alpha. And we just say, okay, uh, you know, what's the probability you get a point at 1, one comma 1? Okay, well, the probability of getting a point at 1 comma 1 is, okay, well, what's the probability that component A produces 1 comma 1? Okay, and we multiply that by 0.5. What's the probability that component 2 produces 1, 1? We multiply that by 30%. And what's the probability that component 3 produces 1, 1? And we multiply that by 20%. And then we add those all together. And that will be kind of like the total probability of getting that component at, you know, the, that location uh, there. Okay? So we just kind of multiply the, the you know, the PDF by, you know, its, its, uh, its parameter alpha here. Um, all right. And then Z is going to be a vector uh, and you'll have a vector for each component and it's going to be zeros and ones, right? So if it's in uh, Z1 will be a uh, 1 if it's in component 1 and 0 otherwise. Z2 will be a 1 if it's in component 2 and 0 otherwise and so on and so forth. Okay, and that and it's going to be used to indicate the class membership of X. Alright, so here I'll just kind of generate uh, some data. So here I have my mixture proportions alpha, here I have my mean vector for uh, component 1, my sigma matrix for component 1, mean vector for component 2, sigma matrix for component 2, so on and so forth. I gather the means together in one list and I gather the sigma matrices in a list. And then I'm going to generate a thousand data points uh, randomly and uh, and so I start off and I just say, okay, you know what, what, um, first of all, sample of uh, value k, k which is 1, 2, or 3, and you're going to just draw a random value k using this probability, right? So, so you can say, all right, so the probability is alpha, so it's going to generate 1s with probability 0 0.5, 2s with probability 0 0.3, and 3s with probability 0 0.2, okay? And then once you have that random value k, generate one value from the random multivariate normal distribution, okay, generate one value, um, and that one value should be generated with a mean, okay, of wh uh, wh whichever compo comes from component k, right? So component k, we're looking at the list and we'll be like, okay, component 2 or 3 or 1 or whatever it is, use that mean and use that sigma matrix, and then, so this will be R and V norm will generate a coordinate in two dimensions, and then comma k. So, so we're going to have a matrix of three columns. The first two will be basically your x1 and x2 coordinates, randomly generated, and k will be whether it came from class 1, 2, or 3. And so I can plot this, and this is what our data look like. So I've generated a thousand da data points, and when I plot it, this is what the mixture looks like. So remember our three components, the first component is centered at 0, 0 and has variance uh, matrix 9, 0, 9, 0, 0, 9. Okay? Uh, there's a component centered at 4, 4 and its uh, variance matrix is 1.9.91. Okay? So high covariance between there. And then there's another component centered at negative 4, negative 4 with um, Variance matrix 2, minus 1, minus 1, 2. Okay? But again, when you generate the data, so you can kind of see, like visually, you can kind of see, okay, there's a cluster here. And you might even be able to visually see that there's maybe a cluster here as well. Okay? But the thing is, is uh, um, they come in completely unlabeled. Right? So it's just a mixture. And, and you're trying to figure out, like, okay, which component do you belong to, right? So, like, this point, these points over here, we could say, okay, you're definitely coming from 
the center component, okay? Um, these ones here, high likelihood of coming from this component. These ones down here, you know, this one's a little more ambiguous, right? If you have a point right here, is it coming from this cluster or is it like just one of the spread out points from the center cluster, okay? Now we have the answers. We generated the data. We can see which points came from what, right? We can see, okay, this one, all of these points in black came from this center cluster. All of these points in red came from this cluster centered at 4, 4. All of these points in green came from this cluster centered at negative 4, negative 4, okay? So, so we have the answers, but when you look at the data, it looks like this. Everything's unlabeled. We don't know, okay? So the missing, missing values here are the label of the points, okay? The label of the point is missing. And, uh, and so in the EM algorithm here, we're going to have to go through iterating between, okay, let's guess the labels, and then let's guess the parameters that generated these things. Okay, so we have the answers, but we want to try to figure out which is which. Let me, uh, let me give you your first view quiz answer. Uh, view quiz answer today is B. B as in bear. B. B. Okay. So, yeah. What is this point? Okay. This point right here. Is it part of the red cluster or the black cluster? Is it part of the the one that's centered at 4,4 4 is a part of the one that's centered at 0,0, 0, okay? I mean, pretty, be pretty sure it's not green, okay? But, but what should it be, right? How, how, do, we, how, do, we, um, how do we assign this to a, to a cluster? Well, uh, the answer is we're not going to directly assign a cluster. Rather than saying that point's for sure going to be in uh, the center cluster centered at zero zero, or or for sure going to be the cluster centered at four comma four. We're going to use a probabilistic assignment. We're going to use the Bayes classifier, and we're going to say, okay, you know, I think it's uh, sixty percent uh, cluster, you know, this cluster, and forty percent the other cluster. Okay, so every point is going to get. Rather than a direct assignment, we're going to give them a membership weight. All right, so we're going to say, all right, um, we're going to say this this point, you know, has a membership weight of you know this this vector. Right, we have three classes, and um, so every point is going to get a vector um, assigning it. It might be like ninety nine percent cluster one, one percent cluster two, zero percent cluster three. Okay, or it could be. Uh, 10% cluster 1, 80% cluster 2, 10% cluster 3, or something like that. Okay, And so every point's going to get uh, a vector of membership weights that says, all right, this is where I believe um, the, the cluster that it belongs to. Okay, And so that is, that's going to be the membership weight. Okay, And once, so once we figure out the membership weights, now we're going to say, we're going to calculate the parameters, okay, the unknown parameters. What's the mean of these different clusters, the mean and variance for each of these clusters that maximize kind of the, the likelihood or the, the probability of generating these values and their weights, okay? And then we iterate back and forth, okay? We're going to calculate the membership weights. Okay, what, what values, what weights do we expect under, uh, under our current parameter assignments? And then we're going to recalculate the parameters to kind of maximize the, uh, the data that we have, maximize the likelihood of the data that we have. Okay? And we kind of go back and forth. And, and so um, this EM algorithm is kind of like k-means clustering mixed with the Bayes classifier. So in k-means clustering, it's, it's iterative in that you reassign points, and once you reassign points, you recalculate the centroids, 
Once you recalculate the sun trades, you reassign points. Okay. Uh, the difference with the EM algorithm and k-means clustering is that when you reassign points, you don't say this point belongs to this cluster. Um, you you use the Bayes classifier and you get a probabilistic weight for saying this point has this probability of belonging to this cluster and this point has this probability of belonging to this cluster. Okay, so you use a probabilistic thing. And then when you recalculate basically your centroids or your means or your parameters, you do it in, in a way that takes into account kind of these weighted memberships. Okay, so as far as calculating your membership weights, we use the base classifier here, right? So given the kind of the x values uh, and all of the current parameter values, that, that would be the mean and sigma matrices, right? We're going to calculate, okay, what is the probability that a point belongs to, say, cluster K? Okay, what's, what is the probability that the point belongs to cluster 1? Or what's the probability that the point belongs to cluster 2? And so this will be, okay, well, what is the probability that cluster... So we're gonna, if we want to say, what's the probability that a point belongs to cluster 1? It'll be, okay, what's the probability that cluster 1 could generate this data point multiplied by the prior probability divided by the marginal, right? So let's say we're looking at this point right here, and we say, okay, we're going to say the, the one centered at 0, 0 is cluster 1, this one's cluster 2, and this one's cluster 3. Okay. So if we say, well, what's the probability that it belongs to cluster 1? We say, okay, well, how likely is cluster 1 to generate this point? And we go, okay, that's pretty likely. Okay. How likely, uh, and then we multiply it by its prior probability divided by the marginal. The marginal is going to be the sum of these likelihood times priors. Okay. How likely is cluster 2? to generate this point. Okay, well we say, well, you know, it's not, it's kind of at the edge of cluster two. So maybe it's a little bit less likely to be coming from cluster two. Okay. How likely is cluster three to generate this point? Very unlikely, right? If cluster three is centered down here, we're gonna say it's very unlikely to be generating this point. Okay? And so kind of the highest likelihood probably, high probability class membership will be cluster one, followed by cluster two, and cluster three will be like close to 0%. So we do that for every single point, we get our membership weights. Once we do that, now we can re we'll have to calculate, okay, how did we get our prior probabilities, right? The prior probability is, um, you know, what's the probability, before we even look at the data, before we even look at the coordinates, what's the probability it came from class 1 or class 2 or class 3? Well, um, here we're going to kind of just say, okay, well, what proportion of points, uh, you know, what is the proportion that belong to a certain cluster, okay? But the this number, number of points assigned to a cluster, it's not an integer, okay? So in your last homework assignment where you did naive Bayes classification, you just said, okay, well, th uh, you know, 30 points in my test data set, you know, belong to cluster, you know, Satosa or something at 30 out of whatever, and so I'm going to, I'm going to get this, this probability. Well, this, it's, this number of points is not, is not an integer, it's going to be the sum of the weights. And so the sum of the weights might be something like 99% and 90% and 88%, and you add those up, and you're going to get some value that's not necessarily uh, an integer, okay? Or actually very unlikely to be an integer. Um, now the sum of all of the the n's will add up to n, okay? So n sub 1, n sub 2, n sub 3 will add up to n because the weights all add up to 1, but um, but here the weights aren't uh, integers. They're not 0 or 1. They're, they're decimal values, and so um, the sum Will uh, will also be, um, you know, some some decimal value there, okay. Um, and then uh, you know, once we do that, we can calculate the membership weights using the Bayes classifier. And here we'll use the normal 
multivariate normal distribution. And so for this, I'm going to use the multivariate normal density. Okay. I'm going to say, okay, what is the probability density of getting the values of this observation? If I know, if my current estimates for the mean of cluster K, cluster one is X bar, and my current estimate of the variance is this. Okay. Is that all right as far as calculating your membership weights and your alpha parameter? Okay, so now, now we have membership weights, okay? And we're going to say, okay, well, this point is, you know, 60% class 1 and 40% class 2 and 0% class 3, okay? Now we ask, okay, with that... With that in mind, we have uh, the membership weights of all of our data points. What is uh, what is the mean of our clusters? Okay, what is the mean of our clusters? All right. Well, we say all we do is we just do a weighted mean. All right. We just say okay, let's add up all of the points, but we're going to take all of the points, multiply it by their weight, and then we'll add them up and divide by kind of how many points, uh, this is again the sum of the weights, okay? The not number of points, it's not an integer, but just kind of like the sum of the weights for that cluster. So we just kind of average our x there. So this is just a weighted mean using um, the uh, the membership weights w. So if, uh, if a point is highly likely to be in cluster k, so it's got like a 99% probability, then its membership weight is close to 1, and it will con contribute a lot towards the calculation of the mean. Okay? Whereas if a point is very unlikely, its membership weight will be 0 or close to 0, and basically doesn't get added into the calculation of the mean. Right? So if you remember, like, how did you calculate the means for k-means clustering? It was basically the same formula, except instead of a w here, you had a z, and the z's were 1's and zeros. Now we're just allowing that vector of whether to kind of count the point x or not into your calculation. Now we're just allowing it to be a decimal value. Rather than ones and zeros, it can just be any, any decimal value between 0 and 1. And, um, and we're going to add that up. And this over here is the sum of the w's, the n sub k. All right, how do we uh, calculate, how do we get our estimate for the variance matrix? Okay, the variance matrix is pretty much the same idea, except we're just going to multiply, um, you know, x minus mu squared, but x minus mu times x minus mu transpose. We're going to just multiply that by the weight. Okay, so we're going to take our vector of x minus mu, um, and the x minus mu times x minus mu transpose, so this will, you know, give us a 2 by 2 matrix and we'll just multiply it by the weights. And so this will kind of give us the uh, kind of the, your weighted variance estimate. And, uh, and so that will give you estimates for the, uh, the mean and the variance, and you need that for all, all three of your components. Okay, and, and that's, that's your homework this week, right? So, so I've left off kind of the code because I want you guys to, to run, write the code yourself. Okay. Um, so again, when the data comes in, it's completely unlabeled. This is how we see the data. And the, the question is, can we figure out what clusters kind of exist in our data? Okay. Um, these are the true assignments. So we know there's a cluster here that's red, a cluster over here that's green. And uh, you know our center cluster uh, is black here, as uh, centered at 0, 0. Okay. And we want to we want to see can we kind of identify this? So I'm going to just start us off with some arbitrary values. I'm going to create a vector that basically says 33% cluster one, 33% cluster two, 34% cluster three. Okay, just so that it adds up to one. It's just some arbitrary values. I'm going to start off with some arbitrary means zero zero. 9, ne negative 9, negative 9, 9, comma 9. And then my covariance matrices will just be the identity matrix for everyone. Okay, so these are just bad 
initial estimates, but we're going to just say, okay, starting with these values, what what will we get? Okay. All right. So this is one one uh, distribution centered at zero zero. One's centered at nine nine. One centered at negative nine, negative nine, and we just say, okay, based on these things, which values get assigned where? Right. Now, one thing to note, and I think I wrote this here. One thing to note is that this the coloring of the points on this graph are misleading. Okay. When when I plot them, I can only color a point, you know, black, green, or red. Okay. Um, and so the color of the point is uh, categorical, but so these points right here that are kind of on the border between green and black, the points here, these points are like 51% green, 49% black, and these ones over here are 51% black, 49% green. Okay, so it, it right here it looks like these are definitely green and these are definitely black, or these are definitely red and these are definitely black, or something like that. But it's a probabilistic assignment, okay? So the probability, if we ask, what is the probability that you know that this belongs to a thing? This one's going to be it's the ones that are on the border but colored green. There'll be like it's fifty-one percent probability that it's green and forty-nine percent probability that it's um, black. And so um, you know when I color the points on the graph, I just have to pick a color, right? I, I, I just went with the highest one gets the color, but it takes away, it hides the fact that they're actually probability assignments, right? As I get closer over here, these ones will be approach closer to 100% green. These ones will be closer to 100% um, black, and you know, 0% red, 0% green, or something like that. But the ones on the border are probably something around 51, 49%. Okay. Um, and, and that's something we kind of lose when we uh, create this, this plot here. Okay? And, uh, and so this is what we have. So based on these points, I'm going to recalculate the mean. Okay? We're going to say, okay, where are what is, mean and variance. So what is the mean of all of these green points? Okay? The mean of all of the kind of all of the green points, and again, we're taking into account um, probabilistic weights, and so that's going to include, you know, some of these points over here. Even though they are shaded um, black, they are, you know, they have maybe a like thirty percent probability that it's green or twenty percent probability that it's green, and we're going to factor those in into our weighted means. Okay, same thing with the points that are in red, um, and so on and so forth. We're going to we take the probabilistic weight, and so in the next thing we we recolor them okay and we've recalculated the mean and the variance and and these are the now the estimated uh, means okay so they, they show up here and these ellipses reflect now the estimated variances okay so starting off we had these terrible variance estimates that were basically you know one zero zero one and Based on all of the data points that are currently assigned to one of the clusters, we say, okay, well, what's a better estimate for the variance? Okay, <laughs> well, the one in the middle says, okay, well, we need to make our variance a lot bigger, right? And then this one says, okay, we're going to recenter ourselves over here. We're going to change, uh, reestimate our variances, and it looks like this. And then again, we iterate, and we say, okay, well, let's recalculate um, the membership weights. After we recalculate the membership weights, let's recalculate our variances. Okay, and I kind of iterate over and over and over, and uh, and this is eventually where we end up going. Right, so it starts off here, and then we end up getting something that looks like this. Okay, so these points all have highest probability weights in green. These points all have pro highest probability weights in red. Okay, And again, the, the labeling of the clusters, whether we call it cluster 1, cluster 2, or cluster 3, is arbitrary. So we just kind of want to see, does, does the, it, is the structure of the data still there? 
And you know, here we've kind of correctly identified the uh, the different clusters. Okay. Again, the true weights or the true assignments. You know, some of these points here are actually coming from the center cluster. Uh, just with high spread, they end up out here. Okay. So this these points out here are kind of a mix. Now, when we do kind of our highest probability assignments, you know, the highest probability if they're over here is going to be. Uh, is going to end up in this cluster over here. Yeah, question. Uh, so it feels like pretty convenient what uh, locations for your starting. I did, I did. Yeah, so you know, I started off uh, here, here, and here. Okay. So what would happen if I started somewhere else? Okay. So um, here I did different starting locations. I I chose this. Oh, so I don't know. Like if, always the same. It uh, it it doesn't always work. Okay. So this one, so here I just did, uh, so rather than spread them out this way, I spread it out vertically. And, um, and with the next iteration, it ends up over here. And it still kind of, it manages to find it here. OK? Um, but yeah, if you started off with really poor assignments, OK? So I think I didn't, I didn't draw it here. But maybe, maybe I can run it. That's not the one I want. So if, if I start off with poor ones, sometimes we end up in the wrong um, in the wrong location. So if I do So instead of, uh, so if I do 0, 0, and if I do, say, um, minus 10, 10, and 10 minus 10, I think we end up with, uh, with wrong, it ends up converging in the wrong way. OK? So it, it, again, you, it is subject to your initial starting points, right? So same thing with k-means clustering. With k-means clustering, uh, the initial assignments are done randomly. And if you, if by random chance your random assignments in the beginning are bad, you could end up with different final kind of cluster assignments here. Um, you know, here we don't really do random assignment in the beginning. You just kind of pick arbitrary locations for your means and, and things like that. Um, is this going to work? Init. OK, so here, well, here I wrote bad start weights, but they still end up kind of working out. Let me see. This one is struggling to knit rendering ordinary text. Did I do something here? OK, here we go. It just took a while to converge. Let's see. OK, so, those, okay, so here I started off kind of like this. And so what gets assigned to this one, there's only like a few points in green that get assigned here. These ones are way out here. And um, OK, that's, that's why it took so long. I, I kept, so after many iterations, so, so basically this one kind of reaches this stable configuration here. And, uh, and once, you know, it's like, I'm good. I have five points here. These ones have high probability. Now. Don't 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 come near me. Don't mess with me. 
And so this has kind of reached and and uh, and it ran for a long time, and eventually this this red cluster kind of merges in and takes over this one, and this one uh, becomes its own kind of cluster, and uh, and this this one down here stays green. So I, I don't know how many iterations it took to uh, to do that. Um, I mean, just do a whole bunch of we'll do that, and then let me just uh, I'll leave the value equals false. I'm afraid to um, delete too much of the other code because it might not. Let's see all these plots here. Okay, so we start off. Uh, okay, so we got that one went converge quickly. All right, so starting here, it goes. Okay, and I still ran out. Okay, so. It takes it takes a lot of iterations, but you can kind of see this. It's almost like uh, like some kind of like tactical war simulation where it's like one one group is taking over or something like that, right? But um, but it's kind of interesting, I think. And also, if you look at like which points get shaded red and uh, Black and stuff like the uh, the border is kind of a, an interesting thing. So, so anyway, this it kind of um, goes and apparently you would need a whole you know a lot more iterations to kind of reach you know its final kind of con converged state. But uh, but uh, that's what we have there. Okay, so this is the EM algorithm for uh, for Gaussian mixtures. I don't know. Um, I think again, just from a high level perspective, the the um, I think the best way to think about this is to think of you know k-means clustering, this iterative you know update your points assignments and update the parameter estimate, but now we're allowing for kind of a probabilistic assignment, so it's a little bit of a blend of Bayes yeah. classifier and k-means clustering fits under unsupervised learning. Okay, the other thing I want to introduce today is principal components analysis. Let me give you your second view quiz answer. Second view quiz answer is the letter E. E as an elephant. E as an elephant. And and I think kind of the primary tool that I want you guys to use for learning principal components analysis will be this uh, junior homework assignment. Again, not truly assigned and not collected, but, uh, but it will kind of lead you through some of the steps of, of doing principal components analysis. So we use principal components analysis. Uh, well, there's uh, several different applications, but uh, one one of the biggest goals of it is dimension reduction. Okay, yeah. dimension reduction. So, uh, you know, there's the issue of when you have a big data set and you have a whole bunch of dimensions. Well, one is it's sometimes it's hard to work with a whole bunch of dimensions, and uh, sometimes uh, if you have uh, a bunch of high collinearity between um, variables, it could, you know, lead to, you know, unstable parameter estimates and like linear regression and things like that. And so what PCA will do is it transforms the data into uncorrelated variables. And we're going to try to reduce the number of dimensions that we have to kind of look at, okay? So 
um, you could look at like a data, data set on housing prices. And there's going to be um, different variables. And so one will be like the square footage of the home. Um, and another will be like the total square footage, which includes places like basements and, um, you know, any, any other kind of space. Uh, you also have like the number of bedrooms, the number of bathrooms, maybe the size of the lot. Um, you might have other uh, variables like if there's a pool, uh, what style roof, what kind of air conditioning or heating system, you know, how many p parking spaces or garage spaces, you know, when was it built, how nice is the kitchen, how nice is the floor, etc. There could also be information on uh, its location or neighborhood, maybe the local school rating, maybe um, the price of the surrounding homes, stuff like that. And um, and so you could have a whole bunch of data sets, right? If you if you go searching for an apartment or searching for uh, a condo or a house or something on you know any of these um, these sites, these are some of the variables that pop up. And um, can we reduce the number of variables that we have to look at? And I would argue that a lot of these variables can be correlated. Are, are, correl are correlated and we can kind of reduce it down to and I would say three three primary variables okay one is how big is the place two is how nice is the place what are the amenities or the quality and then three is what's the location what's the is 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 it in a nice neighborhood that people want to live in or is it you know somewhere else okay where it's you know maybe it's far away from <laughs> You know, it's out, you know, hours away from, you know, a major city, okay? Or, um, you know, maybe it's, it's you know, kind of in a, you know, not so nice part of town where, uh, you know, it's less desirable uh, to live there or something like that, right? Um, and so we, we would have these kind of three different, um, different aspects and and I would say you know we, we might be able to boil down um, a, a potential living place down to kind of these these three components, right? So you give it, um, uh, I guess these subcategories, these categories, you know, ratings versus having all of the individual variables, okay? Um, so. Um, you know, other examples where we try to reduce your number of dimensions um, because it's useful. <laughs> uh, these are some of these other examples, right? So, for example, GPA reduces a student's entire academic performance down to just a single number, right? You know, you get a 4.0, that's good, right? And if you have like a, you know, something below a two, you know, that's, that's not, not so good. And, you know, there's everyone in between, um, by Nate, by very definition, dimension reduction is reductive, right? The whole point of dimension reduction is to reduce some things to something simple. And that means you're going to lose information, right? And so if you are on the admissions committee of a college, and you're going to just look at GPA and say this is the only thing that matters, then um, you're going to be missing out on a lot of other important details. And that's why you know uh, college applications often have will evaluate someone on more than just their GPA, but you know they ask for like their story and stuff like that, right? To try to get little aspects, little other aspects about this person, but. Um, uh, but on the other end, all right, like, should we not do dimension reduction? Okay, if we don't do dimension reduction, now there's just too much information and it's hard to kind of process it, right? Because in order to compare this student with this student, you have to look at their entire academic history and this student's entire academic history. And there might have been, you know, a period in their life where, you know, some, some kind of traumatic event was going on and that affected their grades and things like that. 
Um, GPA is not going to capture that, but um, but as far as GPA goes, it's a useful tool because again, now you, now you've reduced everybody just down to one number, and you can just set some kind of simple rules and say, all right, we're going to look at everybody, uh, anybody who's below a certain number, we're going to just not even look at or something like that, right? And and certainly you might miss out some important candidates, good candidates because of some of these simplified rules, but as far as kind of comparing, um, it, it can make things quicker, right? Same thing with SAT and GRE, all right? They take a complicated idea of intelligence or, I don't know, academic performance. How do you kind of, I don't know what these exams exactly are trying to capture, but um, they boil it down to just kind of maybe two or three numbers. You know, what is a uh, uh, person's, you know, verbal abilities and their math abilities and their writing abilities and things like that. And, um, and now you can kind of, now you have three numbers to compare or something like that, right? You have credit scores and stuff and, uh, you know, how likely is someone going to pay pay you back if you lend them money and something like that. Um, uh, it's, it's a complicated thing. You'd have to probably look at their whole financial history uh -huh. and all sorts of different things. You know, this gets boiled down to a single number, the credit score. Um, and, uh, and a lot of banks just kind of look at someone's credit score and their annual income uh, in order to decide whether or not to make a loan, um, to, to, to offer a loan. And that's, well, so that's, there's, there's pros and cons um, mm -hmm. to, uh, to the system that, that we have. Mm -hmm. Prior to the credit score, though, mm -hmm. prior to this credit score, mm -hmm. whether somebody gets uh, money or not was just a decision made by the banker. Right, the banker was uh, an important person in the town, and you had to be like friends with the banker if you wanted the banker to uh, lend you money, and um, and the banker would hear stories and be like, oh, so and so, they're a you know they're a good kid, so we'll we'll lend them money or you know whatever, and and it was a, a lot more arbitrary, and so the credit score was kind of a, a way to kind of take out some of the arbitrariness of of uh of those banking and loan decisions but now um you know anytime you reduce something to a single number you know some weird things weird things happen okay um and so now you know there's ways to kind of game the uh, the credit score system and, and and inherent problems in that right um okay uh on for sports and something uh, you know, for for football, there is the NFL passer rating, and you just kind of take uh, the quarterback uh, and you look at their kind of entire performance, and it boils it down to a single game, right? Or a single, single number, right? Their performance in a game gets boiled down to a single number, and it factors in things like how many passes were attempted and how many passes were made versus, like, how many interceptions happened and stuff, right? So it's just kind of kind of a just a, a number that, uh, that you get, okay? Um, uh, or in the Olympics, you have these track and field events like the heptathlon or decathlon, right? So uh, where players or athletes compete in several events. You know, they run and they do hurdles and they jump and you have to rank them from best to worst. So it, you have to reduce their performance across seven events or ten events down into a single number of this is gold and this is silver and this is bronze. Um, and how do you do that? If you know if one person jumped farther than the other, but they ran slower on the hurdles, you know how do you, how do you kind of compare these metrics? All right. So dimension reduction in the sense is uh, is useful because a lot of times we want a single ordering of things. So one kind of idea of dimension reduction is the idea of 
casting a shadow. So, and we experience this form of dimension reduction in that, you know, we exist as three dimensional objects. Everything in this world is three dimensional. But then when you look at the shadow it produces, the shadow it produces will be two dimensional. So we're reducing from three dimensions down to two dimensions. Okay? And you can imagine you could project, like, here's my hand, and I could project it like this. And the shadow looks like this, and the shadow is very clearly a hand, okay? But on the other hand, if I, if I hold my hand kind of like, I don't know, in some, some awkward way like this, it's a little bit harder to know exactly what it is, okay? Um, um, or, you know, if I, if I hold it, you know, if you look only at the shadow, there will be certain uh, projections of it that are less um, less helpful or revealing as as far as what the object is, right? So if you see this shadow, you can see, okay, you know, that looks like, you know, some kind of, you know, part. But if I if I project it kind of like this, now now it's hard to know exactly what it is, right? So depending on how the shadow gets projected, it it may or may not be, you may not be able to tell exactly what that object is. All right, and so the idea here is when we reduce the dimensions of our data, okay, by its very nature, we are losing information, okay? We are going to lose information because we're reducing the number of dimensions. But we want to reduce the number of dimensions in a way where we minimize the loss of information, okay? Or another way is to think of it is we want the re, uh, dimension reduced to data to resemble the original data as much as possible. Um, and we can think of it as we want to capture as much of the variance that exists in the original data as possible. So you think of the original data and how much variance exists in the original data. We want to capture uh, as much of that variance as possible. Right? And again, by its very nature, when you reduce the number of dimensions, okay, you're going to lose some of that variance. You're going to lose some of that variance. But we want to find a projection that still has kind of the, uh, the maximum variance in the resulting projected space. Um, let me show you. Just go. All right. So here we have one, two, three, four, five data points, and the data exists in X and Y. Okay. But there is high correlation between x and y, right? And so what we can do, this red and green show kind of the principal components, is the first principal component in red maximizes the amount of variation, okay? All right, and so if we say, okay, let's project this, all right? Let's find um, a one-dimensional projection of this data that maximizes the variation. We can project it like this, Right, and and basically we're saying if we only keep variable prince PC one, we're not losing very much information. Okay, um, because if we look at PC one, you know we get uh, the values are kind of spread out like this. Okay, and this is uh, the second principal component. Right, so the original data exists in two dimensions, and in order to capture all of the variation, you need to keep two dimensions. And any kind of rotation of this system, okay, will preserve the total amount of variation. But the question is, can we find a kind of rotation of the data where if I throw away one of the dimensions and I reduce it down to one dimension, we still keep a lot of the variation, right? And this would be a possible rotation. 
and and we have uh, the data here. And if I throw this away, if I throw away principal component two, how much information am I losing? I'm not losing a ton. Okay, this is uh, an individual who scored, um, you know, a little bit higher <laughs> on. Uh, you know, one of the uh, dimensions, and this individual scored a little bit lower, and, you know, the principal component would just kind of put them all in a line here, okay? So we're not losing um, a ton of information, right? By going, so our original data was in X and Y, and if we just reduce it down to PC1, we're not losing a ton of information with uh, principal component 2, okay? Here is an example with three-dimensional data, our data exists in three dimensions, and it um, and so we have an x, a y, and a z. And if you just say, okay, what it, well, what do the data look like in x, y, and z? Looking only at um, looking um, only at say x, y, or z, or whatever. This is this is kind of how the uh, the data look, right? So if you keep only one of the variables, x, uh, you see, okay, maybe there's like two clusters, and look at y, there's maybe two clusters are looking only at z. This is kind of what the data look like. And the question is, can we find um, a rotation where we, if I were to reduce it to just say one variable or two variables, we're going to capture a lot, a lot of the variation, okay? And so this is the principal components analysis, and it says if you rotate the data in this way, right? So, so I can rotate the data, um, you know, the projection of the data in, in different forms, and it shows kind of the resulting principal component. This says if you rotate it this way, and if you were to just keep only one of the ver uh, principal components, okay, this will maximize the amount of variation that's kept. And so even if I threw away principal component 2 and principal component 3, you know, we're losing a lot of information. But we are maintaining uh, some of the important structure in the data, which is that there appears to be three clusters of points in the data. Okay, we have three clusters of points. And that is not revealed. If we keep only x, keep only y, or keep only z, we would, we would lose the information that there are three clusters in the data. Okay? Um, and, uh, and by kind of projecting the data like this, if I keep only one cluster, all right, or keep one principal component, I would notice that there's three clusters. And then here, if I keep two, PC1 and PC2, then I can clearly see kind of the, the nature of the three clusters, that they look kind of like, you know, round balls here, okay? And, uh, you know, we're losing the depth, okay? But I would say, you know, if we just keep these the information here of PC1 and PC2, and I'm throwing away the third dimension in blue, I would, I would argue I'm not losing too much. I'm not losing too much information here, right? And, you know, there's certainly other projections, and I could take the data and, you know, keeping only two variables, you know, you know if we rotated it this way, I'd say we, we lost a little bit more information than, uh, than this, right? So here... Uh, we can see the three clusters in PC1 and over with PC2, we can see kind of it arches up and down, okay? Whereas if I, if I were to rotate the data, you know, in another way, you know, maybe we lose, we lose some of that information, okay? So I would argue that throwing away the third dimension here, we're not losing a ton, ton of information here, okay? And that's kind of what we're going for with, uh, with principal components analysis. Here's, a, here's another example, right? And this is really an aspect where you realize, oh yeah, you know, having a whole lot of dimensions, high dimensional data is, is difficult, okay? So they, uh, this survey uh, surveyed kind of the, the four. So the United Kingdom is kind of a weird thing, right? Where you get, it's one country, but within the country, there's like four other countries. Um, so you have England and Scotland and Wales and Northern Ireland. And um, 
uh, and and they surveyed the people of these different countries. Um, you know, what do you eat, right? How much how much alcohol do you consume, and how much cereal, and how much potatoes, and this and that. Okay, and uh, and if we ask, if I ask you, hey, look at this data, and um, which one are any of these things more different than the other? It's hard to tell, right? Everybody consumes, I guess, a high amount of soft drinks and a high amount of cereals and, you know, car case meat. I don't know what that is versus other meat and stuff like that. I don't know how they've defined all of this. But a lot of these patterns look kind of similar, and we're asking, well, can we differentiate any one of these from the others? Okay. Well, we can run principal components analysis, and if I just keep the first principal component, then suddenly we see, okay, Northern Ireland is quite different from, you know, Wales, England, and Scotland are quite different from Northern Ireland. Now, geographically, that, that actually, like, Wales, England, and Scotland are all on the same island. And, uh, and Northern Ireland is, is on, on the other island, right? The island of Ireland. Um, and these are on the island of Britain. Um, so, this, uh, so, so we go, oh, okay, well, that's interesting. And then we say, okay, well, how does Northern Ireland differ from some of the, uh, the, the, other, the, the other countries? And there's a couple things that uh, we, can, we can notice, okay? One is Northern Ireland seems to consume fewer alcoholic drinks than the other two. Also, if you look, compare fresh fruit and fresh potatoes, okay, um, the other three countries all consume more fruit than potatoes versus Northern Ireland consume more potatoes than fruit, okay? And that maybe um, aligns with, you know, some of the uh, stereotypes that we have of, of Ireland and, uh, you know, and, and their cuisine. But, uh, but, you know, this principal components analysis kind of picks up on some of the differences you know, how do we maximize, how do we capture the most amount of variance that exists in our data? And it, and it picks up that, you know, these, these, uh, these points are different, okay? All right, and then if you look at the second principal component, now, now it starts to differentiate, okay, what is different from Wales and Scotland and things like that? And we can kind of try to pinpoint exactly what, what's being different and but it's a you know a second secondary uh, difference there. Okay, so uh, what does this end up looking like? Okay, well mathematically, how do we how do we do uh, deal with principal components analysis? Okay, well again the idea is we want to find a projection, and we're going to define a proje our projection 